You and I were designed for one primary purpose, and that was to worship God, to have a heart of worship, because worship is something that we put value to. Worship is something that, that it not only costs us something, because it, what does the worship cost you? It costs you your time. It costs you your devotion. It costs you prioritizing. And worship is not just a song. That's praise that leads to worship. But worship becomes a lifestyle in putting God first in everything that we do. Putting him first and foremost. Because really, if you think about whatever you worship, the world worships money, for example. Mammon. You know, I mean, they, when they get a lot, they just want more. I, I, I asked, uh, I heard someone asked, I didn't ask, but I heard someone ask a multi cazillionaire whatever he was, how much is enough? Another dollar. In other words, there's never enough. enough. It doesn't matter how much you have. When, when you worship money, that's what your focus is on, and, it, and that's what you will hold to. And people worship different things. But if we worship God, and we're going to move in the things of God. We're going to be um, looking to the things of God, to the ways of God, to the truth of God. So what we put worth on, what we value is so important. And, you know, God wants us to worship him. Why? He wants us to be worshipers of what is true because he wants the best for you. He wants the best for me because God is love. And we become like the ones that we worship or the things that we worship. So if we worship God, we're going to be more like God. The more we give our lives to him, the more that we lay, become laid down lovers of God, the more we're going to, we're going to be uh, um, drawn to who he is and the ways he is. The way he is. Ways? <laughs> the way he is. I just got to tell you, friends, it's so important because the more we know about him, his nature, who he is, how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he desires to empower us, to encourage us, to establish us. All these words are in the Bible. All these attributes of God are in his word. He has not come to harm us, but give us a future and a... Why? Because hope defer, deferred makes our heart grow sick, right? But the desires of fulfilled is the tree of life. And God has come to give us life and life more abundantly. So the more that we have him in our hearts, the more we value him, the more that we get up in the morning and put him first in everything throughout the day, into the night, the more his presence is going to be with us and the more empowered we're going to be because of it. To do good things, to do right things. So I want you to turn your Bibles to John 4 and verses 22. And it talks a little bit about this. Are you there? You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must, say must, worship in spirit and truth. So the spirit, we all have a spirit. We're born with a spirit or we wouldn't have a breath. But God in his original design, designed for his spirit, to, to, to our spirit to control our soul. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. So if our spirit and his spirit is communing with our spirit, then what we think about, what we, what we do, you know, all those things, how we feel, all those things are going to line up with who he is and who he says we are. So we have to get to a place, friends, that, that we start to worship in spirit, and he is spirit. And his truth is right here. Right in his word. He is the word, right? So... What the Lord shows us is his nature is what we should hold fast to even during difficult times. How many people know that times are difficult right now? Maybe not in our lives, but in, in, around the world as a whole, around our nation, we're seeing a lot of difficult things going on. And I, I really believe that we have to recognize what's the authentic and what's the counterfeit. 
Too often, people get involved and get to following and looking to and focusing on the counterfeit rather than the authentic. You know, when a bank teller or, or people, you know, that, that deal with money, they don't study the counterfeit to be able to recognize a counterfeit. They study the authentic so that they'll know what the counter, when the counterfeit shows up. We need to be studying the authentic. The word of God, the very heart of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, the love of God, the truth. Because if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. So as we hold fast to these things, we have to recognize that Jesus cautioned. I love this when Jesus gives us warnings. And he does it through his word. But how many people know that if he gave a warning to his disciples, it was also meant for you and me? Right? Because we're all called to, to be disciples and disciplers. Amen? So in that, saying that, he says, uh, beware of the leaven, right, of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. Why? Why would that be? The leaven, what does leaven represent? What, is, what does this represent? Well, the leaven of Herod was the political system, if you will. And the political system, Herod's mindset, doesn't mind if you have God, just as long as you don't bring it to the table. Just as long as you don't bring it to the equation. Just as long as you don't bring it to the courthouse. Just as long as you don't bring it to the schools. Leaven of the Pharisees, though, is a religious spirit that has God at the center of everything, but it's in person. He's impersonal and he's powerless. He's impersonal and he's powerless. The Pharisees asked Jesus after he got done doing all these signs and wonders and and healings and all this. He says, "Show." They say, "Show us a sign." What? Where have you been? Because, see, all they're trying to do is, is come across like they have power and they have authority. And, and he'll do what they want him to do. Can I tell you something? Both a religious spirit and a political spirit, both of them want power. Both of them want to be exalted. Both of them really want to be esteemed. The Pharisees knew about God. Oh, God, when he was right in front of them. Friends, it's not, it's not enough just to know about God, what he did. It's important that we spend time with him in his presence so that we know him, so that we have a relationship with him. So when we, when we pray, we're talking to him. And we're having a conversation. So it's not a monologue, but it becomes a dialogue. In other words, when I speak to the Lord, he speaks to me. When he speaks to me, I speak to him. Why? Because we're friends. Now, that might seem kind of, um, to, to you or to some, might seem, well, wait a minute, that's pretty. No, it's because he, he says that. His word says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And if we're friends, then we should be able to communicate with one another. We should talk to one another. We should hear what our friend is telling us. Does that make sense? Okay. But that's through relationship. That, that's something that he's desiring, that he's longing for, that he, he wants from each and every one of us. But he's always speaking. But guess who else is always speaking? The enemy. I don't want to give him any credit, but he's always speaking. He's, all, he's always lying to us. He's always trying to push things, and he always tries to make him look, make, make it sound or look real. Why? Because he's the deceiver. He, he is the one that always tries to mimic the real. Okay. I know I said this in the past, but I've just got to say it again. Fear always attracts what's necessary to bring um, justification 
or to bring uh, uh, le legitimacy to whatever it, um, it's trying to accomplish. So in other words, fear will always try to bring us into a place that it will justify and will sound good. You know, it sounds right. It sounds like a, a, a good thing. But the problem is, is that fear will always try to attract to itself what it wants to accomplish. And it's never about what God wants to accomplish. So the wrong kind of fear will drive us away from the lordship of Jesus, but the right kind of fear will drive us to him. Amen? It's called reverence. It's called uh, being in awe of the power and the glory and the love of God. That he spoke everything into existence. Wow. But does he want us to be scared? No. He, wa he wants us to know that perfect love casts out all fear. We can't uh, walk in fear if we truly know the love of God. Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have fearful moments, but as we, as we seek him, as we, as we look to him, and we look to his promises, and as we allow our faith to rise up, then we can, that perfect love can cast out all fear. Has anybody ever feared before? When COVID hit, how many people found themselves fearful? Of course. But there's a difference between fear that's attached to wisdom and the fear that's trying to imitate wisdom. Now, the fear that is attached, um, you know, it, it, that, that has some wisdom to it is that if, there, if there's a, you know, if you're, having a, if you're having a barbecue, you know, or maybe you got, a, you got the logs around the fire, you don't put, if someone falls in the fire, you don't put your hand in there to grab it out. That's wisdom. Right? I'd be afraid to do that. How many, how many would you do? Right? But, but there's other fears that the enemy tries to put on us and to bring upon us to keep us out of God's plan. For us. Matthew um, 13, 33 says that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. I want to tell you about the kingdom. The leaven of the kingdom. Because it's so important that we understand this. Leaven of the kingdom is opposite. It defines every relational, personal. And, and, and the, it's, it's relational, it's personal, and it's, 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 got, it's connected with the presence of God. In other words, it, it's defined as the person of Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom. He says the kingdom is here. Why was the kingdom he, is here? Why was the kingdom there? Because the king was there. You can't have no kingdom without a king. So when the king showed up, that's why he was able to legitimately say that the kingdom is here. The kingdom is there. You know what? The, the kingdom, this kingdom, the leaven of the kingdom will permeate human society, penetrating evil and transforming lives. It will do that. We position ourselves and allow ourselves, it will transform our lives. Because it's the presence of God. It's like this today when we were worshiping God. Did you feel it? Wasn't it beautiful? I mean, before I even came out of the green room, Oh my goodness, I just felt the presence of God just, it was so beautiful as we were worshiping. It was awesome. And then what happens is, is that when we get into the presence of God, all the worries and concerns about whatever's going on out there starts to fall off of us. But the kingdom of God is eternal. It's not temporal. Matter of fact, the kingdom of God, to some degree, is invisible. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean, Pastor? Invisible. Well, the kingdom of God, it says, is not meat or drink. It's not what you can see or what you can eat or what you can hold on to, right? But it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean the manifestations will not be evident and what we will not recognize those things, but it's not in the natural. See, our carnal minds want to see things in the natural. But our spirit wants to grab a hold of things of God, of things in heaven, and bring them down to the natural.
kingdom mindset is where our thinking always has hope and trust and will build on the eternal things of God. It has a different approach in the natural. When we start to look to the, the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, when we see things going on, we don't respond in the same way. We're in the Spirit. We don't respond with hate. Now, you might say, well, I hate sin. Well, yeah, but you know what? That's not, you don't hate the person. You just hate the sin that's manipulating the person. We are to love people. You, the Bible says if you, if you say that you love God, and, but you hate your brother, then you're a liar. Can I tell you something? We pray every Friday, and we're praying for all the people that are making knucklehead decisions. Why? Because we're called to love them and pray for them. Jesus gives us purpose and identity. He gives us the awareness that we can build and release when we, when we see who he is and what his will is and what his ways are. Jesus said, I never do nothing or said nothing while he was here on earth. I, I don't do anything or say anything unless the Father has said it or done it first. That's why it's important not to be complacent and apathetic. I tell you something, it's the fire of God that will activate the leaven in your heart. We're talking about heart here. Because it's our heart that will bring us into a place that we can actually receive and have revival. It's in our heart that as the fire of God starts to manifest. That, that's why Jesus says, man, don't be lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Why? Because you're either hot or cold. If you're cold, it's because you don't know him. But if you know him, you need to be hot. You need to be passionate for the things of God. And the fire of God will expose and expand and reveal the leaven. Think about that. When you're making, how many women ever made bread? When you heat it up, what happens? The leaven starts to activate and the, and the bread um, rises, right? So, we see that there's fire in his presence, and, and it will reveal whatever's on your mind. It's the perfect love of God that leads, uh, leads you and motivates you when you're, when you're in kingdom, when you're influenced by kingdom, when you're influenced by his love, when you're influenced by his word. I think about um, fear. Think about faith, how opposite they are, how far away from each other they are. Fear is something that's it's, um, it's really trying to masquerade as wisdom in the sense of, of that it, people will say things in our, in our culture, in our society, will say things that sounds good. We're seeing this right now. I, I'm reminded that when my daughter, Jessie, when she was pregnant with Luna, the doctors said that uh, she should abort that baby. She should abort that baby. And, uh, you know, of course, because she's, they told her that if the baby lived to be a year, it would have to have a couple heart surgeries. And so, obviously, there's, okay, well, we have enough money to do that. Well, we have to, what will we have to go through? Uh, you know, I don't think that their intentions were bad. They're just misguided. So faith says, no, my God is bigger than the problem that the doctors see, than the problems that the world sees, than the problems, right? So we begin to pray, we begin to intercede, and we get, begin to believe, and so here we see, and, and you know what provoked me to even share this was because my daughter just sent a, uh, a Facebook message that I was holding Luna, and, and it's time to go home, but not, with, not when Papa's holding you, you know? And I'm thinking, yeah, because why? She brings us such joy. But can I tell you something? That baby girl is two years old, going to be three, and let me tell you something. She is healthy. She is funny. She is full of love, 
And I'm telling you, so, so we could have bought into the lie of the, of the doctors who meant well. We're in a culture right now, there's a lot of problems going on out there over abortion. Y'all are hearing it, but there's a lot of deception that's being released also. The, the Supreme Court, hey, we don't, the, it's not over. We got to keep praying. So the Supreme Court just put it back to the states and say, now your voice matters. So what you vote on and what you guys decide in the states, that will be the law of the, of the state, whether you have it or you don't. They're not saying that because there, there's things that the enemy's trying to push as wisdom. Oh, it's, it's women's choice. Well, I believe in women's choice. Anybody else not believe with, that women should have a choice? But I also believe that if the choice is in the act. The problem is they're not, no one wants the consequences of the choice. And fear would say, well, wait a minute. I'm not ready for that yet. And I might not be able to afford to have that baby. And, and this is going to change my life. And then whatever. But can I tell you something? The world system would try to say that's a fetus. But my Bible says, I've woven you to get, uh, together from the innermost parts of your mother's womb. That's a baby in the womb. You say, well, pastor, why are you getting political? No, I'm not getting political. I'm getting biblical. The bottom line is, is, is fear will always try to, to look like it's, a, it's wisdom. And, and the enemy will always try to influence people. And it might seem very good and very right. It might look good, but the bottom line is, is it it right in the eyes of the Lord? So I think about baby Luna. Those doctors meant well. They were concerned about what my daughter and her husband and we would have to go through if she went full term. But what, what it did was it took God out of the We need to have God in every equation. We got to put God back into the equations of every choice that we make in life. And so, you know, for me, I I just got to tell you that, you know, the Bible talks about that Cain and Abel, because of one brother killing another, that the, the blood was crying out. We got 70 million babies' blood that's crying out. And then I think about the, I think about the senator that years ago, I heard about this, that the senator, and then I'm going to move on, but the senator, there was a senator that said, listen, before every, they went on to pass a bill, before every woman decides to abort, let her see what she's aborting. Well, Why not? Why wouldn't you? Why would you want to keep that truth from that person? Because their agenda is not for the well-being of the person. Their agenda is different. It's being influenced by a different spirit. Because if you are a woman, you're, if you're a person, you already uh, have the DNA of God in you, so you're going to know what's right and what's not to some degree. You're going to have that. I don't care what kind of influence you have been in, uh, around in the world. So what happens is if, if they have to go and see an ultrasound and see that beautiful little baby that has a heartbeat and that has a head and, and hands and fingers and toes, what are they going to think? Man, I can't do this. God will make a way or we'll figure it out or whatever. I don't know where their faith is, but hey, the bottom line is, is that they might change their mind. And so what did they do? They fought that with everything. But if they, if they truly cared about the women's choice, why wouldn't they allow the facts to be in, the truth to be in? Then let them make the, uh, the decision and the choice. Not that, I'm a, not that I'm advocating that. But to me, the enemy will always try to keep the truth hidden so that its agenda will come forth. That's it. So, so, in Hebrews 11, turn your Bibles there. We're going to keep going because I don't want to get stuck on this, but you know what? World issues, societal issues, our culture of the day is important that we understand. We've got to put biblical values to whatever the, whatever's being taught, whatever's being said, whatever's being done in our society today. 
that we see throughout the history, not just throughout the Bible, but throughout history, that every culture that fell in to idolatry, every culture that fell into murder, every culture that fell into um, perversion, always was destroyed. Always came in to slavery. The problem is we're... We're, we, we, sometimes we can be a culture or there's cultures out there that are going to be comfortable with the safety of, 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 you know, of falling into slavery of whatever's being taught them rather than allowing themselves to be empowered by God to rise up and allowing the actual responsibility of truth, the responsibility of, 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 of who we're called to be and what we're called to do to rise up for our freedom. How many people know it, there's a cost to freedom? But when, when good people say and do nothing, then evil is perpetuated. Then evil is, 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 is it grows. That's why it's so important as the body of Christ that we become a voice crying out in the wilderness. That we, be, <coughs> excuse me, that we can become people that are not going to hold to the things of the enemy and the things of the world, but instead be focused on the things of God. And, but when we do it, we don't do it with hate or malice. We do it in love because he cares for us. Excuse me. <coughs> and he cares for everybody out there that doesn't agree with us. So we have to care for them too. Does that make sense? It's so important. I don't want ever come across as that we, we have something against people or people groups. That's not my heart. That's not our heart. God loves everybody. It's, the Bible says he laid down his life for the world, not for his followers. Getting this. Hebrews 11, are you there? It says, by faith, huh, 11.23, I'm going to start at 23. Uh, it says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was beautiful, a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Can I tell you something? My daughter and her husband, Danny, was not afraid of what the doctors told them. We, my wife and I, were not afraid of the report of the doctors because we said, let's hear God's report. And we began to pray. God healed that little baby girl. Come on. She's had no surgeries, and they said she wouldn't live past a year, and she's over two years going to be three. Yeah. So praise God. Can we give God a hand? Yeah. <laughs> And then it goes on to, see, the thing is, the story of Moses begins with love and faith of, uh, 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 of his parents. So in other words, it was generational. There was, a, there was a generation of not being afraid. So here they were, the most powerful nation in all the world, were going after the firstborn or whatever, right? They're going after the male child. And they said, no, I'm not going to fear, because that child is beautiful. I'm not going to fear the, the, the Pharaoh. Instead, I'm going to hide this child until God gives me a word or gives me something to do and how I'm to move forward. It was generational. And verse 24 says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused, say refused, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now here he was raised in Pharaoh's house, had all the wealth and everything. But once he knew his identity, he could no longer sit by and see the people persecuted and go through what they were going through without doing something or saying something. Only divine faith can influence such a great choice, which looked far beyond his present circumstances in his life. See, too often we're so focused on our circumstances, what's right in front of us. We don't allow our faith in the expansion of divine nature of God to influence us in a way that we see things in a much broader picture. 
We th see things in now time rather than internal time. Well, not you guys, but other people out there. I'm just saying, you know. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Wow. You think there was a call in his life? Think that he was starting to get it? The, the, the passing pleasures of sin. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked toward the reward. Now, i got to take a minute and break this down for you. The word looked here is apolipo in its original. Apo means away from and blipo to see. Let me look away to see. Let me look away from what's in front of me. Let me look away from what's around me. Let me look away so that I can see the bigger picture. Moses looked away from the wealth of the world system and looked to the messianic future. To look to what his future was going to be. Verse 27. Faith, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Say invisible. Only a godly faith can see the invisible. Got to be able to see the Spirit. 28. By faith he kept the Passover and, and the sprinkling of blood, lest he, um, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should, should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as, as, dry, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Now let me just say this. It's by faith that they started to, he started to walk out his destiny. It's by faith that he kept the Passover. He says, okay, listen, take and sacrifice a lamb and, and, and then put it on your doorpost, right? What is that evident of? On the wood of your doorpost, the blood of the lamb on the wood of your doorpost, the blood of the lamb on the wood of your doorpost, the blood of the lamb on the wood of of your doorpost. He sprinkled it so that when the, when the spirit of death came by, it would pass them over. See, that was a picture of God's eternal plan for you and me, for all those who can believe, for all those who can be obedient and have faith enough to say, I receive that because it's by his stripes that we're healed. It's by his blood that our sins are washed white as snow by his blood. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we see that, but then, then we go on to see that here, they're at the Red Sea. There's a, the army, Pharaoh's army coming after them. They're in a very challenging place. So in the natural, fear would be probably a thing to have, right? But guess what? God moved with a mighty wind, and he separated the Red Sea. And the, his, 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 the wind, what does wind represent in the Bible? Holy Spirit was a blowing, and they walked across on dry land with two walls of water stopped as they crossed over. But how many people know when the enemy who's trying to kill and destroy them tried to get over in the midst of the anointing of God, guess what? They were all drowned. I'm telling you, friends, that God is greater. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. When we start holding on to the word of God, to the ways of God, to the will of God, when we start positioning ourselves to do the right thing, make the right choices for the right reasons at the right time, when we start putting our faith up to God, start to praise his holy name, he inhabits the praises of the people, the glory of God is manifest in us, and now God is going to move through us. I'm telling you, this is a time and a season when the just will rise up and they will start to declare the goodness of God in the land of the living.
not just with their mouths, but with their actions. And then God will bring people to repentance so that they too can receive everlasting life. Come on. Moses knew by divine faith that in the kingdom, ruling is to serve. In the kingdom, ruling is to serve. See, in the world, ruling is to be served. What can you do for me? I love what President Kennedy said. Don't think about what the country can do for you, but think about what you can do for your country. I think about this. We rule to protect. We serve to empower. We rule to protect. We serve to empower. In the kingdom, every position of authority is to protect and to empower. It's all about faith, and it's all about faith being demonstrated into a way that the kingdom of God is being demonstrated be, be, from the beloved of God. See, walking out in faith is all about walking down, as laid down lovers of God. It's all about submitting to the Lord. It's all about releasing your own agendas and receiving his. The, the Israelites got a report from the majority. I want you to turn your Bibles down. And I'm going to end it probably on this one. I'm not going to get through it. I have to do a part three. God is so good. Numbers 14, if you can turn your Bibles to there, but I want to give you a little background because the Israelites got a report from the majority, got a report from the ten spies, and that they looked and they saw things with their own vision, with their own mindsets, with their own fear. And they said, man, it's, they're fortified cities. There's like giants, of, sons of Ankin are in there, and they're giants, and, 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 and man, we just can't do it because they thought about doing it on their own strength, with their own way, will, and ways, with their own abilities. But there was two. Joshua and Caleb, you know the story, that they saw those as bread to them. They said that if God wants us to go over, then he will deliver them into our hand. They were people that walked in faith while the others walked in fear. But fear looked like wisdom. It looked like, why would we put our wives and our children, you know, why would we do that? Let's just stay in the wilderness. Or better yet, hey, let's get a leader and let's go back to Egypt where our pots were full of meat and bread. And, oh, it was like kumbaya around the fireplace at night. Are you kidding me? How deceived can you be? They were slaves with harsh taskmasters. Sometimes we, dis, um, we think that the multitudes have the answer. And if, they, if a lot of people agree to something, then they must be right. But that isn't, that is not truth. That may be facts, but the truth is, is that if it's not tied to biblical truths, it's not real. It's just temporary. It's not eternal. It's temporal. It's not divine. It's carnal. That's why it's so important to stay in faith, power, and promise of God's word. Stay in the faith, the promise, and the power of God's word in every one of our circumstances, in everything that we face, in everything that we do. It's all about presence. It's all about being close enough to Jesus that we're going to hear the real. Amen? Okay, let's get started. Numbers 14, 6 through 9, and I'm going to close. This is my second closing. Okay, I'm going to close with this. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, nah, whatever, who, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes after they were saying the things that I just shared with you. And, and they spoke to all, say all, the congregation of the children of Israel saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. 
And if the Lord delights in us. Now, are you guys getting this? See, this is where the faith comes in and the fear goes out. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the, this land and give, give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not, now here's your caution, only do not rebel against the Lord. Nor fear, say fear, the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Woo! Can I tell you something, friends? It's important that we grab a hold of this because there's so much in this little bit of Scripture here that we have to see that, that not only did they speak to the whole congregation, not only did they put themselves out there against what a, a popular uh, you know, will or word would be, they came against what the enemy was pushing, Right? And, and, and then they told the truth, which was the, 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 that it was exceedingly good land. But then here's the thing. What they were trying to point out was if you have faith, if, if the Lord delights in us. How, do, how, do, how does the Lord delight in us? We cannot please God without faith. So when we step out in faith and move forward in faith, then he delights in us. Are you guys getting this? So I want to just encourage you with this because it's so important. Um, it's, it's one of those things that, that we have to be people of faith. And we have to be people that are, our faith is lined up with his promises, with his plans and purposes for our lives. That we can be more, we can, we can be, Brittany, if you can come up. We can be more in tune with what he wants to do in us, and then we can believe for more, and then we can respond accordingly to our faith, to our beliefs, not to what the world is saying, not to what the religious spirit is saying, not to what the political atmosphere is, but instead, what is the word of God that's eternal, that is never ending? This book will never be outdated. It is the living word of God. It is sharp as a two-edged sword, cutting through bone and marrow, soul and spirit, to even to revealing the intents of the heart. Sometimes we think we're right, and all of a sudden we open up the book and say, oh, oh, oh I'm not quite as right as I thought I was. Or, or maybe, <clears throat> maybe what I thought was right, but the way I did it was wrong. I tell you, friends, there's a lot of people out there that are very deceived. Very deceived. There's an enemy out there that went around like a roaring lion seeking whom he devour. He comes to kill, still, and destroy. God comes to give life and life more abundant. He does it through people that have his heart. He does it through people that don't walk in fear, but walk in faith. He does it through people that want to make a difference and love those people who are deceived enough to tell them the truth. In love. In spite. Not in uh, uh, anger. Not in hate. Not to win. Seriously. I know there's a lot of people out there that they're doing things that they think is right. But what they're doing is wrong. But they're not going to hear people that, like us, if we go there spiteful, hateful, angry, we've got to see the love that's behind it. If we say and do nothing, then evil will only be in power. Good people have to speak up. Pray up. And I'll stand, please.